Welcome everybody to deep learning. So today we want to look into optimization and we want to check out different versions of gradient descent procedures and how to deal with different sets of parameters. The field is kind of stabilized to the point where some core ideas from the 1980s are still used today. So we've seen that the gradient descent is essentially optimizing the empirical risk. Here in this figure, you see that we do one step each towards this local minimum. We have this predefined learning rate eta. So the gradient is of course computed with respect to every sample. And this is then guaranteed to converge to a local minimum. Now, of course, this means that for every iteration, we have to use all samples. And this is called batch gradient descent. So you have to look in every iteration for every update at all samples. It may be really many samples in particular, if you look at big data in computer vision problems. This is of course a preferred option for convex optimization problems, because we have a guarantee here that we find the global minimum. Every update is guaranteed to decrease the error. Of course, for non-convex problems, we have a problem anyway. Also, we may have memory limitations. This is why people like to prefer other approaches like stochastic gradient descent. Here they use just one sample and then they immediately update. So this is no longer necessarily decreasing the empirical risk in every iteration. And it may also be very inefficient because of the latency transfers to the graphical processing unit. However, if you just use one sample, you can do many things in parallel, so it's highly parallelizable. A compromise between the two is to use the so-called mini-batch stochastic gradient descent. Here you use B, and B may be a number much smaller than the entire training data set of random samples that you essentially choose then randomly from the entire training data set. Then you evaluate the gradient on the subset B, and this is then called a mini batch. Now this mini batch can be evaluated really quickly, and you may also use parallelization approaches because you can do several mini batch steps in parallel. Then you just do the weighted sum and update. So small batches are useful because they offer a kind of regularization effect. This then typically results in smaller eta. So if you use mini batch in gradient descent, typically smaller values of eta are sufficient and it also regains efficiency. Typically, this is the standard case in deep learning. So a lot of people work with this, meaning that the gradient descent is effective. But the question is, how can this even work? Our optimization problem is non-convex. There's an exponential number of local minima, and there's an interesting paper from 2015 where they showed that the methods that we are typically working with are high dimensional functions. There are many local minima in this environment. The interesting thing is that those local minima are close to the global minimum, and actually many of those are equivalent. What is probably more of a problem are saddle points. Also, the local minima might even be better than the global minimum because the global minimum is attained on your training set, but in the end you want to apply your network to a test data set that may be different. Actually, a global minimum on your training data set may be related to an overfit. Maybe this is even worse for the generalization of the trained network. One more possible answer to this is a paper from 2016. The authors are suggesting over-provisioning, as there are many different ways of how a network can approximate the desired relationship. You essentially just need to find one. You don't need to find all of them. A single one is sufficient. Liang et al. verified this experimentally by experiments with random labels. 
Here the idea is that you essentially randomize the labels and you don't use the original ones. You just randomly assign any classes and if you then show that your experiment still solves the problem, then you're creating an overfit because your labels don't contain any information at all. And there is very little theory behind the best solutions that we have at the moment. Let's have a look at the choice of EDA. What we've already seen that if you have a small learning rate, we may stop even before we reach convergence. If you have a too large learning rate, we might be ending jumping back and forth and not even finding the local minimum. Only with an appropriate learning rate, you will be able to find the minimum. Actually, when you're far away from the minimum, you want to be able to make big steps. And the closer you get to the minimum, you want to make smaller steps. If you want to do so in practice, you work with the decay of the learning rate. So you adapt your EDA gradually. So you start with, let's say, 0 0.01, and then you divide by 10 every X epochs. This helps that you don't miss the local minimum that you're actually looking for. It's a typical practical engineering parameter. The stuff that works best is really simple. Now you may ask, can't we get rid of this magic either? So what is typically done? Quite a few people suggest doing a line search in similar cases. So line search, of course, needs you to estimate the optimal EDA at every step. So you need multiple evaluations in order to find the correct EDA in the direction that the gradient points. It is extremely noisy anyway. So people have presented methods, but they are not the state of the art right now in deep learning. Then people have suggested second order methods. If you look into second order methods, you need to compute the Hessian matrix. And this is typically very expensive to calculate. So far, we have not seen that too often. There are LBFGS methods, but they typically don't perform very well if you're operating outside of the batch setting. So if you work with mini batches, they are not that great. There's a report on that by Google that you can find in reference number seven. What else can we do? Well, of course, we could accelerate the directions of persistent gradients. So the idea here would be that you somehow keep track of the average that is indicated here with V. This is essentially a weighted sum over the last couple of gradient steps. You take the current gradient direction indicated in red and average it with the previous steps. This then gives you an updated direction and this is typically called momentum. So we introduce this momentum term. There you add with a new weight some momentum that is indicated with V superscript K minus one. This momentum term is essentially computed in an iterative fashion where you iteratively update over the past gradient directions. So you can essentially say by iteratively computing this weighted mean, you keep a history of the previous gradient directions and you gradually update them with the new gradient direction. Then you pick the momentum term in order to perform the update instead of just the gradient direction. So typical choices for mu are 0 0.9, 0 0.95 or 0.99. You can also adapt them from small to large if you want to pay more emphasis on the previous gradient directions. This overcomes poor Hessians and variance in the stochastic gradient descent. It will dampen oscillations and it accelerates the optimization procedures. Still, we need the learning rate decay, so this doesn't solve the automatic adjustment of EDA. We can also pick a different way of momentum, the Nesterov accelerated gradient or simply Nesterov momentum. This performs a look ahead. 
So here we also have this momentum term, but instead of evaluating the gradient at the position we are currently at, we add the momentum term before computing the gradient. So we are essentially trying to approximate the next set of parameters. We use the look ahead here and then we perform the gradient update. So you can rewrite this into the conventional gradient. The idea here is to put the Nesterov acceleration directly into the gradient update. This term will then be used in the next gradient update. So this is an equivalent formulation. Let's visualize this a bit. Here you can see momentum and the Nesterov momentum. Of course, they both use a kind of momentum term, but they use a different direction for calculating the gradient update. That's the main difference. Here you see an example of these momentum terms in comparison. In this situation, you have a strong disagreement in the variance in both directions. So we have a very high variance in the left and right directions and a rather small variance in the top bottom direction. We are trying to find the global minimum. This then leads typically to alternating gradient directions very strongly even if you introduce the momentum term. You still get the strong oscillating behavior. If you use the Nesterov accelerated gradient, you can see that we compute this look ahead and this allows us to follow the blue line. So we are directly moving towards the desired minimum and we are no longer alternating. This is an advantage of Nesterov. What if our features have different needs? So suppose some features are activated very infrequently while others are updated very often. Then we would need individual learning rates for every parameter in the network. We need large learning rates for infrequent parameters and small learning rates for frequent parameters. In order to accommodate the changes appropriately, this can be done with the so-called Adagrad method. This is using first the gradient to compute some g superscript k and then it's computing the product of the gradient with itself to keep track of its element-wise variance in a variable r. Now we use our g and our r element-wise in combination with eta to weigh the update of the gradient. So now we construct the updated weights and the variance of the weights in every parameter is incorporated by multiplying with the square root of the respective element, which means an approximation of its standard deviation. So here we note this down as a square root of an entire vector. All the other things here are scalar, which means that this also results in a vector again. This vector is then multiplied pointwise to the actual gradient to perform a local scaling. It's a nice and efficient method and allows individual learning rates for all of the different dimensions and for all of the different weights. One problem could be that the learning rate decreases too aggressively. This is a problem and leads us to an improved version and the improved version here is Armas Prop. Armas Prop is now using this again, but they introduce this row and row is being used essentially to introduce a delay such that you don't have very high increases. Here you can set this row in order to dampen the update of the variance of the learning rate. So Hinton suggests 0.9 and eta equals to 0.001. This leads to the aggressive decrease being fixed, but we still have to set the learning rate. If you don't set the learning rate appropriately, you run into a problem. Now Ada Delta tries to improve on this further. They use essentially our arm as prop and get rid of Ida. So we already have seen R. It is the variance that is computed in a dampened way. Then in addition, they introduce this Delta X it's a weighted combination of some term h and the r that we have seen previously multiplied 
to the gradient direction. So this is an additional dampening factor that replaces the eta in the original formulation. The factor h is computed again as a sliding average over the delta x as an element-wise product. So this way you don't have to set a learning rate anymore. Still, you have to choose the parameter rho. For rho, we suggest going to 0.95. One of the most popular algorithms that are being used is Adam. And Adam is essentially also using this gradient direction g. Then you have essentially a momentum term v. In addition, you have this r term that is again trying to steer the learning rate for each dimension individually. Furthermore, Adam introduces an additional bias correction where v is scaled by 1 minus mu. r is also scaled by 1 over 1 minus rho. This then leads to the final update term that involves the learning rate eta, our momentum term and the respective scaling. This algorithm is called adaptive moment estimation for Adam suggested values are mu 0.9, rho 0.999 and eta 0.001. It's a very robust method and very commonly used. We can combine it with the Nesterov accelerated gradient and then you get NADAM, but still you can improve on this. Adam was empirically observed to fail to converge to optimal good solutions. In reference 5, you can even see that Adam and similar methods do not guarantee to converge for convex problems. There's an error in the original convergence proof and therefore we suggest AMS grad that fixes Adam to ensure non-increasing step size. So you can fix it by adding a maximum over the momentum update term. So if you do this, you result in AMS grad. This is shown to be even more robust and the effect has been shown in large experiments. One lesson that we learn here is that you should keep your eyes open. Even things that go through scientific peer review may have problems that are later identified. Another thing that we learned here is that the gradient descent procedures, as long as you approximately follow the correct gradient direction, you still get quite decent results. Of course, such gradient methods are really hard to debug. So be sure that you debug your gradients. This really happens as you can see in this example. Even large software frameworks may suffer from such errors. For a long time, people didn't notice them. They just noticed strange behavior, but the problem persists. Uh, machine learning is the science of sloppiness, really. <laughs> okay, let's summarize this a bit. The stochastic gradient descent plus Nesterov momentum plus learning rate decay is a typical choice in many experiments. It converges most reliably and is used in many state-of-the-art papers. Still, it has the problem that this learning rate decay has to be adjusted. Adam has individual learning rates. The learning rates are very well behaved, but of course, the loss curves are much harder to interpret because you don't have this typical behavior as you would see with fixed learning rates. What we didn't discuss here and what we only hinted at is distributed gradient descent. Of course, you can also do this in a parallelized manner and then compute different update steps in different nodes of a distributed network or on different graphic boards. Then you average over them. This has also been shown to be very robust and very fast. Some practical recommendations. Start by using mini-batch stochastic gradient descent with momentum. Stick to the default momentum. Give Adam a try when you have a feeling for your data. When you see that you need individual learning rates, then Adam can help you with getting better or more stable convergence. 
You can also switch to AMS Grad, which is an improvement over Adam. Of course, start adjusting the learning rate first and then keep your eyes open regarding unusual behavior. Okay, this brings us to a short outlook on the next couple of videos and what we are coming up with. Of course, the actual deep learning part, we haven't discussed this at all. So one problem that we still need to talk about is how we can deal with spatial correlation and features. We hear so much about convolution and neural networks. Next time, we will see why this is a good idea and how it is implemented. With, say, image recognition or something like that? Of course, one thing that we should think about is how to use variances and how to incorporate them into network architectures. Some comprehensive questions. What are our standard loss functions for classification? and regression. So of course L2 for regression and cross entropy loss for classification. You should be able to derive those. This is really something you should know because the statistics and their relations to learning losses are really important. The statistical assumptions, probabilistic theory and how to modify those to get our loss function are highly relevant for the exam. Very important are also subdifferentials. What is a subdifferential? How can we optimize in situation where our activation functions have a kink? What's the hinge loss? How can we incorporate constraints? And in particular, what do we tell people that claim that all our techniques are not good because an SVM is superior? Well, you can always show that it's up to a multiplicative constant, the same as using hinge loss. What is Nestor of momentum? These are very typical things that you should be able to explain if somebody is going to ask you these questions in a piece of paper. Of course, we have plenty of references again, and you see that I have quite a few slides that I have to click through. And this is already the end of the current unit on loss and optimization. So I hope you liked this little video and I'm looking forward to welcoming you in the next one. Bye bye.